Hello everyone, we are on time. My name is Sarah Fine and I'm chairing our panel today. I teach philosophy at King's College London and I'm a fellow at the Forum for Philosophy at the LSE. It's my great pleasure to welcome you to the Forum for Philosophy's first event of the autumn term. It's also our first online event. We have a really exciting term lined up for you, so please do continue to tune in. We're broadcasting live now and we are recording this event for our podcast series. You can tweet along with us using the hashtag, hashtag LSE Forum. Time, wrote Craig Callender, is a big invisible thing that will kill you. It affects all aspects of our lives from the legal and political to the very nature of our experience. As lockdown highlighted for us all, it's agonizing to be in a state of limbo, to have our ordinary routines and expectations disrupted, to be unable to plan for the future. Paradoxically, when it comes to looming disasters like the climate crisis, we seem to prioritize our interests in the present. Meanwhile, we may think of time as something neutral and impartial, but then we also see that some people's time is valued more highly than others, that time is used both to punish and to reward, and that people can be victims of forms of temporal injustice. Our brilliant panel today will be exploring our complex relationship with time. I'll introduce them now. Dr. Amma Azuz, is an analyst at Arup and an honorary research associate in the School of Geography and the Environment at the University of Oxford. He's a collective member of City Journal. Amar's interests include the destruction and reconstruction of history, culture, and the built environment in times of conflict, with a particular focus on the crisis in Syria. Professor Elizabeth F. Cohen, is Professor of Political Science at Syracuse University and is currently a visiting fellow at Princeton University's Center for Human Values. She's the author of four books, among them The Political Value of Time, Citizenship, Duration and Democratic Justice, published by Cambridge University Press in 2018. At Princeton, she's working on a book about the political significance of waiting in line and a first come first served as a distributive principle. Professor Matthew Soteriou is Chair in Philosophy of Mind at King's College London. He's the author of The Mind's Construction, published by Oxford University Press in 2013. His research ranges across philosophy of mind, philosophy of action and epistemology. And of particular interest for us today is his work on temporal phenomenology. Thank you all so much for joining us. After discussing these themes with the panel, we're going to turn to questions from our audience. So please feel free to type in your questions as we talk. So first of all, we're gonna think about perceiving and experiencing time. And I'm going to turn to Matt to get us started today. So our perception and experience of time is of profound and enduring interest to philosophers. Could you start by telling us a bit about why that is? Yeah, thank, thanks, Sarah. Um, so first of all, our experience of time kind of frames everything that we sense, experience and do. So any experience of any movement, any experience of any um, change, persistence, the experience that you're having now of hearing me speak words, even the experience of um, thinking thoughts privately to yourself, they all depend on temporal awareness. So your awareness of things occupying time and filling intervals of time successively. So even when you're not thinking explicitly about time, temporal awareness is, is kind of nonetheless implicated in the way that you're experiencing and thinking about things. So it's always there in the background, framing everything, conditioning our experience of everything. Um, one way of putting this is to, to say that um, for as long as we're conscious, we occupy a point of view on the world. And that point of view is essentially temporal. And there are some basic things we can say about that, that temporal point of view. For instance, it's a point of view that's centered on the present, um, from which we're oriented to our past and our future, 
and we're oriented to past and future in, in very different ways. So that's reflected in the fact that we, we recollect our past, we um, anticipate and plan for our future. And that, that point of view is um, always there, it's inescapable for us. And it influences our perspective on everything. So our perspective on the world, our perspective on ourselves, our perspective on each other and our perspective on our lives. So that's, that's why kind of reflecting on the experience of time and our temporal point of view turns out to be really important for understanding all kinds of big philosophical questions. Um, so questions about what there is, questions about what we are and questions about how we should live our lives. Um, I mean, I can say something briefly about any of those, but, uh, but uh, yeah, you, you interrupt whenever you want. Thank you, that's perfect. Yeah, it would be great if you could say a little bit more for us about how this experience of time and our, and the way in which it influences our perspective on everything uh, has some kind of role to play in philosophical questions about how we should live. Okay, so, um, I mean, first of all, how we should live depends in part on who we are. So the, the, the respect in which influences our perspective on, on ourselves is, is really important. Um, so for example, the sense that we're free agents is connected with a distinctive way in which we're psychologically oriented to time, in particular, how we're, we're oriented to our future. So we regard the future as open in a way that the past isn't. And that, that apparent openness of the future is bound up with our, with our sense that we're free agents, that that we're free to determine our own futures. But our sense of identity, our sense of who we are is, is also affected by how we're oriented to our past. And that's because the sense of who we are is profoundly influenced by the way we sort of map and reconstruct our past. So our mapping of the past is, is inevitably partial and incomplete. There's always going to be holes and gaps in it. Um, but our sense of identity, and this includes our sense of identity as groups as well as individuals, um, it kind of depends on um, which aspects of the past we recognize as ours, um, how, we, how we draw those temporal boundaries, um, what aspects of the past we, we highlight and underline, what we celebrate and commemorate, um, what we regret, and of course, as well as what we, we ignore and overlook and omit in our kind of narratives of self-understanding. Um, so that, that's a way in which it's, it's relevant to our sense of who we are, which in turn will be um, relevant to the way our, we live our lives. But there's, there are other more, more direct ways. I mean, um, our, our temporal perspective is bound up with our um, evaluative perspective in, in interesting ways, I think. I mean, by, by evaluative perspective, I mean um, our sense of what matters to us, um, including our attitudes to death. And that, that can be brought out by considering temporal dimensions to certain emotions and, and sentiments that we experience. So you take, for example, grief or regret or nostalgia or relief um, or anticipation and anxiety, hope. Those are, those are all emotions that reflect distinctive ways in which we can be oriented to our, our past and future. But they also reflect what we value. So that's what I mean by saying our, our temporal perspective is bound up with our evaluative perspective. So there's a kind of interdependency there, I think. And secondly, our temporal point of view also plays a, a role in how we give shape to our lives by planning our futures. So how we structure our agency over time, including extended intervals of time, and how we coordinate our lives with one another. So as, as kind of self-conscious reflective creatures, we're capable of thinking about the sort of temporal point of view that we occupy and consider how we might alter the way we respond to that temporal point of view and, and what reasons we might have for doing so. So for example, some suggested the sort of temporal point of view that we, we typically find ourselves immersed in reflect certain biases on our part, temporal biases, perhaps temporal biases that we'd, we'd be better off without. So for in instance, we seem to be much more disturbed by our future non-existence than our past non-existence. Um, it, it's also been noted that we tend, to, we, we tend to prefer to have unpleasant events behind us in our past rather than in front of us in our future. 
And we also tend to care more about events in the nearer future than, than the more distant future. So we tend to prioritize or some people say overvalue the near future at the expense of our more distant future. And so there's a question about whether, whether those are irrational biases. And if so, if there's anything we can do to combat them. Um, and finally, as, as these self-reflective creatures, we're also capable of representing time by adopting conventions and uh, creating artifacts that reflect those conventions. For instance, our clocks, our calendars. And which conventions we adopt and how we choose to deploy them obviously has a huge impact on how we um, live socially, how we coordinate our lives with one another. So obviously then there are bound to be all kinds of practical, ethical, as well as political issues that arise um, about the ways we, we represent by means of conventions and, and what sort of uses we put them to. That's really fascinating and gets us off to a brilliant start. Thanks, Matt. And at this point, I'd like to invite um, Elizabeth, if she'd like to join us in reflecting on what Matt said so far. Thank you so much. Um, Thank you. Uh, so I can't uh, think any of the thoughts that I want to think as an academic without the kind of background um, discussion and and, um, and by being informed by the kind of work um, that Matthew does. And I um, I'm really uh, enriched by it and appreciate it. I am specifically as a political scientist focused on how we interact with time as political beings and how the state uses time. And uh, I became interested in this when I was finishing up a book on citizenship and I ran across um, a, 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 common, a British common law case that I found really interesting in which a, a one particular date turns out to be incredibly important to whether people can consider themselves natural born subjects, um, mm -hmm. the predecessor status to, to being citizens. And this got me really interested in um, the subject of deadlines. So we are all uh, familiar with the experience of a deadline. And I realized, uh, and, and I think we have a sense of, even if we don't put it this way, that deadlines are these incredibly important boundaries that structure our lives. So not only can we see deadlines that, um, that carve boundaries around the citizenry, <clears throat> um, we can see deadlines that actually create entire sovereign states and we interact with all kinds of deadlines in our in our daily lives that um, that serve as boundaries for how we experience not just time but power <laughs> and um, and they're kind of like different types of deadlines in our lives not just more or less important deadlines but also there are deadlines that happen just once right so um, you know we're born and and um, that's like a, a one once in a lifetime will only happen one single moment deadline. There are also deadlines that we will experience that are kind of countdowns. So once you're born, you're going to have a countdown um, until the moment when you uh, reach the the age of majority or the age of consent when you become a full citizen and have all of your rights. And, and um, so that's kind of an expanse of time that's particularly significant that we think, um, you know, is something important is happening in there. And then uh, in politics in particular, there are these recurring deadlines that are really important to whether we can consider ourselves, you know, a democracy. So recurring deadlines are things like um, elections that we hope very hard <laughs> um, happen uh, at, on a very regular scheduled interval, um, but they allow us to, to make and then remake ourselves by giving us punctuation points um, at, at which we can, we can change course and, and make new decisions. Deadlines aren't the only way we experience time in politics though. Um, quantities of time can become really important to our political lives and it particularly important I think to to egalitarianism in liberal democracies. So um, we will have to wait for uh, quantities of time, particular units of time to get things. Um, one way that we're really uh, familiar with this is we punish people in units of time. So if somebody is, um, is convicted of a crime and is incarcerated, there will be a sentence it's usually built on a formula and they have to serve out that time. We don't actually agree on what is going on during that period of time, 
but it does represent something. Um, for most of human history, we didn't punish people using units of time, um, and, and now we do. So it's, it's a distinctly modern thing. We think there's a process happening. We don't agree on what the process is. Same goes for other uh, important uh, quantified time and politics. So I'm particularly interested in um, immigration and when people uh, qualify for, um, for naturalization to become citizens, it is almost universally the case that they'll have to wait out a probationary period before they can actually go through the process of naturalization. And um, if you asked, you know, a bunch of people why, they'd all come up with very different answers, yet the idea of the probationary period is quite, quite universal. Um, and and um, what I, I analogize this in, in my work to the, this, um, to, to kind of an economy in which we can exchange uh, units of time, um, quantities of time for power and politics, we can kind of transact with the state and say, you know, if I wait this period of time, um, I'm going to expect these types of powers or rights. And conversely, if I kind of commit an infraction, I understand I'll have to do without some of those rights for a period of time while I wait to, to become worthy again. And um, and, you know, there's all kinds of ways we can think about this, we, you know, to, to get back to a point that, that Matthew made, um, you know, uh, we, we may, um, like, we may think that this is really neutral and, and, and fair, um, but we may also recognize that our time is actually um, different than uh, our experience of that time is different than somebody else. So somebody who's, um, incarcerated while pregnant is having a very different experience of let's say a two year sentence than somebody else. But most significantly, um, even though we have a sense that time might be a more neutral way to transact over power than say like, you just have to give a bunch of cash to get your citizenship. Um, we can come up with instances where it's very clear that people who are quite similar see their time valued differently. So in the US, undocumented immigrants, no matter how long they're in the country, do not qualify to naturalize. Uh, in the US also, we incarcerate um, racial minorities overall for much longer periods of time than, um, than white citizens, even when their crimes are quite similar. And, and you know, if we've decided that people's time has value, <clears throat> and that, that um, they're moral beings and that different processes are happening during this time, that is essentially, um, in effect, a statement that we don't actually think all people are moral equals uh, when we don't treat their time equally. And, um, and you can reveal all kinds of injustice when you start to see the state treating people's time, uh, similar, similarly situated people's time in different ways. That's really fascinating. Thank you so much. I love the line in your book where you talk about naturalization is often time plus residence and good moral character equals citizenship. I thought that that put it so well. Um, Matt, just out of interest, thinking about what Elizabeth has said, is the kind of political and ethical side of time something that you've reflected on at all in, in your work or is it something that you'd be interested in? Uh, thinking through in more detail. Um, sorry, something that I haven't um, thought through in detail, but I'm something I, I am very interested. In. I mean, I started working on a, a, a book on temporal perspectives that that will will cover um, various different ways in which this this temporal point of view I was talking about and the way we we experience time and think about time affects our lives. And I suppose the first step for me would be thinking about the the ethical, um, so the, the political gets far too complicated for me. I mean, I've, I've read Elizabeth's book and it's fantastic. It's really, really interesting. Um, but, but there's something very, very general to say, which is that the way we think about and represent time solves a kind of coordination problem for us. Um, and that, that coordination was how, how we live together. And, um, and, as the, as, the, as the world gets smaller, so distances can be traveled at, at greater speeds, then that, those, these communities get larger and larger and there are more and more individuals to coordinate. 
right? And so, that, so that the, the coordination problems multiply. Um, and as, as Elizabeth was saying, there's, there's one way of thinking about what you're doing, which is entirely neutral. And you might think it's, it's neutral insofar as um, using units of time or using particular quantities, measures of time is a neutral way of um, approaching questions of coordination. Um, particularly if you try or at least make an attempt to distribute equitably how you're portioning out those quantities of time. But, but it's, 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 it's not clear that, that what results is a flourishing life for, for, for everybody in the same kind of way. Um, so there, there, there's, a, there's a kind of way of solving a coordination problem, particularly among huge global communities that, that, that can be really useful. I mean, for example, dates and calendars got us to um, this event at the same time, right? Miraculously across different continents. And these are, these are totally conventional ways of representing time that have these really valuable functions. But then and now when you try and, um, carve up time in terms of boundaries, deadlines, um, quantities of time that have this massive impact on, on people's lives, whether it's um, for punishment, reward, um, or deadlines, or where you draw temporal boundaries as well as spatial boundaries for citizenship and statehood and so on. Um, then, you know, as I say, the, 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 the problems multiply and that gets really complicated. Brilliant. Me. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. That's really fascinating. So I'm going to come back in a moment to Elizabeth to, to think a bit more about the political value of time. But before we do that, I want to bring in Amar and ask whether there's anything that you would like to say in response to what Matt and Elizabeth have said so far on, on the perception and experience of time. Yeah, thanks a lot, Sarah. And first of all, thanks a lot for uh, making this event happen and for the invite. and. Um, thanks also for everyone who made the time to, to join today. I think one of the most exciting things in the lockdown, or maybe one of the very few good things, was that everyone can join from everywhere at any time. So it's more liberating. And so thanks for making the time. I think um, there are two points that I got from, um, or like I, I was thinking about when Matthew started um, talking about time. And I think the first one is thinking about defining who we are and what do we do through the lens of time. And my question or like the thing that came to my mind is that how our um, thinking about time has been impacted um, by the crisis of the COVID-19, how our perception of time and priorities changed um, at a time of um, extremists. So for instance, many people started quitting their jobs or cleaning their homes or uh, uh, breaking up with their relationships. So redefining and negotiating who they are, what's important for them, what's the priority. And I think in a time where there is lots of information, everything is now, 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 and more, 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 I think that the lockdown, uh, the lockdown gave us a time to think. And I think that's what has been missing in our lives, like just slowing down and having a different rhythm of life. I think that was very crucial for many people, just like to slow down a little bit, to have more time for oneself, um, to sit and think and reflect. And I think that's really missing in the rhythm of life that we're, we're living. And I, I wonder, there's no, no need to answer me, Matthew, but if there's any uh, points you want to, to make on that, the relationship between time and crisis, how our priorities shift on, on this. So that's maybe my first point that I wanted to reflect on. But the second one, you spoke about um, uh, also grief. Um, and you wrote about uh, the past made present, and also you spoke about, uh, you wrote about uh, time in a dream. And I, I wonder, you, you mentioned the word nostalgia, and this reminded me of the work of uh, uh, Svetlana Boim, uh, who died in her uh, 50s, actually, uh, who, uh, who wrote the book Future of Nostalgia, about the relationship between um, the past and the present, and how um, we sometimes remember uh, or uh, yearn for a past uh, or a space or time that maybe never existed. Um, and you spoke about how um, we would construct and map that past. So I wonder if, if you have any thoughts on like, how do we individually or collectively construct that past um, to shape our uh, present and future? Uh, so I think these were the two points that uh, came to my mind. And I wonder if, uh, yeah, if Matthew has any comments on them. Thank you. 
Thanks. Re really interesting and, and, and big issues there. I mean, it's just to start with the the, the last question that, that you raised. Um, yeah. So um, I mentioned that we kind of we map uh, our past, but also reconstruct our past. So so given that our our perspective on our past is always going to be partial, right? I, I don't think there's any such thing as complete picture. It's always going to be partial. Wh which things that we, we we focus on and and underline and how we regard them can make a, a very big difference to our, our sense of of who we are. I mean, just to think of it as our past and and, and what what story it tells us about us now. Um, and and. I, I said kind of construct or reconstruct so that there's inevitably also an element of invention, I think, when we um, map out our, our past and um, um, use that to, to think about who we are. I mean, origin myths are, are really important and, and there's, there's origin myths for, for all kinds of groups, um, and not just for humanity, but for, for um, collectives, groups of people, nations, and so on. Um, and, and there's always going to be some kind of um, partial mapping and reconstruction invention in, in how you draw those boundaries. Um, but, but then also how you, how you go on to um, allow that past, which may be in part invented, to, to echo through the present. I mean, that, that is most obvious in the way that we have anniversaries, commemorations, and, and, and so on. What we choose to um, make national days of anniversaries or commemorations can, can, as a collective, can have a big effect on our sense of who we are. And that, that's this, this thing of underlining certain bits of the past, highlighting those, it, ignoring others, um, and, and regarding it as something to celebrate. I mean, that, for example, in, in the case of an anniversary, potentially. That that's that has a really big impact on your sense of who you are as a collective. Um, on, on the on the on the the crisis, I mean, I suppose that this is kind of obvious in a way. Depending on the, this was an unusual crisis. So on the one hand, I think any any crisis introduces uncertainty. So now that that's more future oriented, um, and uncertainty about the future creates anxiety. So and, and anxiety is a, is emotion that's kind of you might think the point of anxiety is to to um, coerce the occupation of your attention on resolving wh whatever the uncertainty is um, and, and plan for that. And, and the problem is when you have a, a crisis that makes the future very uncertain, then it can create anxiety, but also um, completely disrupt what evidence you have about what's going to happen, which might allow you to plan for the future. So that, that can be quite disturbing. This was an unusual crisis because it kept us locked in. Um, so there's a respect for, for some, it created more time. Um, whether it created more time or not, I mean, in some sense it didn't, didn't create any more time. We still had exactly the same amount of time. What it did though was disrupt the, the, the as, you, as you said, the rhythm of, of our lives. Um, what we do when those, um, schedules, schedules, those conventional ways of organizing our time, some of which were Elizabeth was talking about, and, and disrupting that, those um, routines, those standard routines, which depend on just arbitrary conventional ways of organizing our day, can be sometimes also, um, well, kind of refreshing, because you get to see that these things aren't necessary. <laughs> Um, and so that you can you can have dip your toe into a different way of um, experiencing time through different ways in which the the, the routine of the day is organised. I, I have to say, I think when, when there was when it's the lockdown started for me, I I, I thought there was going to be lots more time, and it ended up less time because <laughs> now. Um, <laughs> Your, there's a respect in which there, there weren't boundaries really between work and home because that, that's a way of organizing your, your day as well. So you're, you're, you're accessible 24 seven with current technology. And those kind of boundaries can be, be really important for allowing that, that kind of isolation that you're 
that you're talking about. So the respect in which the lockdown for many, I think, didn't create any kind of isolation, but but quite the opposite. Um, so you know, not isolated from colleagues because they're they're communicating um, instead of knocking on your door, which they, they they may be reluctant to at some points, but but not isolated from your family twenty four seven as well. Right? Um, so it's like having the, having them all together <laughs> at the same time. I think at least for some. Mm. Brilliant, thank you. My goodness, I could continue discussing this all night, but I'm gonna have to make my first of my time jokes that we will run out of time. So we better press on and to think a bit more about some of the themes that Elizabeth introduced to us from her wonderful book on the political value of time. Uh, so one of the things that was really fascinating for me it, reading it is that you know, once you start thinking about the role of politics, of the role of time in politics, you realize it's just everywhere, it shapes everything. I thought there was another line that I really loved, which was that we can't see or feel a date on a calendar or a deadline on a schedule in the same way that we might be able to see armed guards standing in a row or feel rays of wire installed in the ground. But the date and the deadline can divide people and political power at least as effectively as the armed guard or the fence which was really a kind of fascinating insight. So I just invite you, Elizabeth, to, if you like, say a little bit more about the book. And of course, to tell us a bit about your new work on the politics of time related ideas around waiting your turn and not jumping the queue and so on. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Um, yes, so when I wrote that particular uh, passage, I was thinking as I often am about um, different types of policies that cut people in or out of um, both the citizenry and the and the polity um, and then various types of rights and you know in, in the US we've had fights over statuses um, that you might gain if you arrived in the country brought as a minor um, brought by your parents uh, and you know, you have to have come at just the right date to qualify, just the right age. Um, it's a very slim segment of the population that qualifies, and there's no material, meaningful difference between people, you know, who got there um, before midnight on June 12th or whatever the date is and, and after. And, you know, borders themselves, people who haven't been near a border imagine like it looks like it does on a map, just a line. But of course, borders are, are very hard to pin down um, and, and contested. And even if you think that you've nailed down your border, it may be the case that, you know, some sand shifts or something and all of a sudden there's a river running through space that you thought was very precisely defined. Time, um, to, you know, can feel like it it is in a way, um, uh, more more um, easily pinned down than that territory, or at least as easily pinned down. <clears throat> but it also turns out to be something that shifts um, below our feet as Amaro's questions um, prompted us to, to think. And um, now we're starting to worry about this. Uh, you know, if anybody is watching US politics right now, you, you know that we, um, are worried about our election, but also um, we're watching various gambits that involve delaying um, decision making or trying to speed up decision making in order to make a particular outcome more likely. Um, and the outcome in particular that's that's uh, that we're interested in right now is is um, outcomes about lifetime appointments to the Supreme Court. So the one the one type of position you can have are really high office in the US where there's definitely not going to be an end point or a deadline at, at which um, the state removes you from office. Just, just, just death can do that um, or retirement. And, and, um, and so, you know, I remember when um, this first became an issue and everybody realized like, oh my God, there's no deadline for doing this work. There's absolutely no temporal structure. And having a really good temporal structure, good set of deadlines is absolutely critical to politics, um, to democratic politics, right? You have to have a political calendar if you want um, power to change hands. 
again, to refer to Amar's um, questions for Matthew, in a state of emergency, usually deadlines go out the window, temporal calendars and structure go out the window. Um, we're not experiencing really a, a political emergency in COVID, right? It's a, it's a different type of emergency. Um, but it could trigger a political state of emergency in which we lose our temporal structure. And that will be, that's, a, that's just a disaster for democracy. Thank you. That's, that's really, really interesting. Um, so I'm going to invite Amar back into the conversation here, because I know you've got some very interesting things to say, particularly about uh, the practice and burdens of waiting. Um, so would you like to say a little something about that? Yeah, sure. Um, so I think um, just a little bit about my interest in, in, in time is the link between time and space and places. So I study usually and my research is focusing on the relationship between cities and urban violence. But to understand this relationship is very crucial to look at the, the time element. Um, so for instance, many of us have witnessed the destruction and the fractions of destruction um, of Palmyra, for instance, and the cultural heritage in Syria across the news. But what's happening in the mass media, we only see fractions of what happens in, in war zones. Um, um, I'm talking about Syria, where I'm from. But I think like what's very important to look at is that the struggle and the transformation of these moments of destruction that we see in the news into how the, the destruction turns people's lives into slow suffering across time. So for instance, now we are all in lockdown and we're reshaping our lives um, for several months. So depending on which country you live in at the moment, it's since March here in the UK where I'm in London now. But imagine doing that for a decade. This is almost like my life, just in waiting. Um, I left Syria in 2011, in November, and I never returned. Uh, I met my family only once since then. So the practice of waiting for the war to end, waiting for re reunited with your family, waiting for rebuilding your cities where 75% of the city is destroyed, where I'm from, in Homs. Just like we live in years and years of um, practice of waiting. And actually in just in this month, um, on the 16th of October, but um, nine years ago in 2011, an explosion took place in my own street. Um, and in that explosion in, in Homs, in my neighborhood, one of my friends was killed who was in his early twenties. He was a final year architecture student and I was one year older than him. Um, and that that moment is like something that I would always remember, and I try to to link that street, my my hometown, with the, the killing of my friend. But I think many people have found 2011 as a, a turning point in, in history. So whenever you ask any Syrian, um, how is your life? So you would often question, is it before or after 2011? So time for us was defined is defined by 2011 because it's a there's a mass um, reshaping, remodeling of what's happening on the ground through time. Um, if we look at the lens of 2011, more than half of the population is displaced, more than 12 million people are displaced from their homes, for instance. So for us, there's a collective sense of loss, losing people, losing the city, losing the streets, losing uh, the customs, our traditions, the ability to go home, nostalgia is, the, the yearning to return home, but for us, even the return home, it's uh, many of us are unable to return home. And secondly, even the return, if hopefully it happened, it's no longer the home that we left. It's a, it's a place that maybe, or maybe, or maybe not, we would be able to recognize. Um, and I think that's was very important. But behind this, um, radical destruction of cities, like in, in Aleppo, in, in Homs, in, uh, in, in Mosul, in Iraq, uh, in Iraq, for instance, and in many cities like in Yemen and Libya, what's very crucial for me as a, a scholar in urban studies to understand is the relationship between the wartime um, destruction and the seeds of conflict that led to this destruction. So looking at the work of Rob Nixon, for instance, um, uh, who wrote uh, on American cities on slow violence, it's very crucial to, to link these um, radical moments of destruction as we, what we see in the war times with the past events 
of decades of slow suffering, uh, slow uh, eradication of history, destroying cultural heritage, displacing people, creating inequalities in cities. I think linking these pre-war situations with what's happening in conflict is really crucial to understand how cities are reshaped in, in, in terms of conflict. And I think a lot of scholars have focused on orbicide, which is the killing of the urban, and looking at how cities are reshaped through uh, the lens of conflict. But what's often missing is to look at the violence in a city through the lens of time. So now in, in Syria, it's almost like a forgotten war. Um, we hardly see an article uh, online on it. What we witness after the moments of destruction that we have seen and the millions of people who crossed to different countries into Europe and into Turkey and Lebanon and Jordan, um, what's happening now is that all these moments of um, radical um, destructions have now transformed into chronic urban trauma for people where the everydayness is a struggle, everyday practices is a struggle. Um, even like there was a report this week on, on The Guardian um, um, talking about the struggle of people to get their bread, their daily bread is a struggle. So um, I think that's really missing in, in terms of like um, understanding conflicts and how people eventually would live for years and years just in the practice of waiting. And I think I just wanted to, to reflect on um, how do we transfer that into words? Uh, what I found really uh, powerful once I was reading a, a poem that I found really reflecting uh, the losses that we have endured, uh, which is by the poet, the American poet, uh, Elizabeth uh, Bishop, um, who, uh, who wrote a very famous uh, poem called One Art. And uh, if I can just uh, try to, to recite some of the, the words because she really uses words that focuses on time and the practice of time, um, she would say, um, the art of losing isn't hard to master. So many things seem filled to be uh, um, seem um, filled with the intent to be lost, but their loss is no disaster. Lose something every day, except the fluster of lost door keys, the hours badly spent. The art of losing isn't hard to uh, to master. So you can really see how loss has been put into words by this poem, and how she would show you that it's slowly and sometimes goes fast, and you have like cycles of losses. So many of us, like we left our homes thinking that it's gonna be matters of weeks. We took few things, but then you just know that it's uh, matters of years and maybe decades, maybe generations. And you just try to live a life where you know that you're losing every day slowly. And suddenly it's just like accumulation of losses, not only personal losses of our uh, personal struggle. Like I live in the comfort of a great city in London but there is a sense of collective loss of, um, of a sense of home or a sense of homeland. And I think um, that's what we live with in time. It's like, a, just, uh, I think I would uh, recapture the word of uh, Rob Nixon, slow violence against us, like slow suffering. Thank you. Thank you so much, Amar. That was really beautifully put. And I, I'm also thinking of a line that you quoted in your wonderful paper on a tale of a Syrian city at war, where you mentioned that Nura, an architect, says, the one who has no past has no present, which I thought kind of really nicely illustrated this tension that you express about what what should you do in the context where your home has been destroyed what's the next step so you write in that paper about how should you deal with the rebuilding process should the rebuilding process be you know a, a new destruction of what exists and, and something completely fresh or should there be some effort at reconstruction, even though reconstruction is obviously not going to be the same as what was? I wonder whether you might say a little bit more about that, you know, the difficulty with being future oriented when you're suffering from this kind of loss of home, loss of place. Yeah, I think we come back to, to the question that I asked me, Matthew, about the relationship between the past and the present. And I think in a lot of situations where you have a conflict um, or when you have a divided city, let's say like Berlin, which was divided, or Beirut after a civil war, uh, which ended in 1990, you often want to escape from that um, chaotic situation and to forget what has happened. And in many times, like what happened in the Berlin Wall, 
um, it started disappearing from the city and from the landscape of the city. But suddenly, after years and years of removing the wall, people thought, ah, this is part of the memory of the city. This is um, showing us how we were divided. And this is exactly the same what you see in, in the UK, where we have Coventry Cathedral, which was destroyed um, uh, by the war. But the decision was to keep it as it is ruined um, and then to rebuild a building next to it. So I think there's a very tense relationship between how do you remember something and um, um, how do you forget something? And also the question of who decides what to remember and who decides what to forget. And in Hiroshima, a city that was like, we all know about the Hiroshima bomb, but there's a memorial of one of the very few buildings that were still standing. It was decided to keep it as a stamp that this is what happened here. So I think these buildings are actually traces of difficult past, of tragic past, of um, a past of struggle and loss and uh, death. And I think through the built environment, uh, I know that Elizabeth uh, focusing on politics and Matthew on uh, philosophy, but I think through the built environment, we can also read um, time and maybe understand um, the urban fabric around us um, and the time, what happened in that city through these buildings. Um, so how do you remember? Um, how do you rebuild? I think these are really critical questions and very difficult and challenging to answer. Thank you so much. Um, obviously, incredibly rich and much more to be said about all of these things. But I'd like, if I may now, to bring in our audience who have some excellent questions for us. Uh, and I'm going to start with a question from Kerry Young, who has, uh, who wants to put this to all of you. And the question is about time and aging. So Kerry asks, what about the phenomenon of time appearing to pass faster as we age? People of senior age, uh, senior years, with perhaps fewer responsibilities and activities, report time is passing very quickly, whereas younger people with very busy lives often, often feel time is passing slowly. Is it simply something to do with the body clock knowing the time, or perhaps it's something else? Should I start that with Matt? Um, yeah, so I, I don't think, as far as I know, um, it's, it's um, not something that's explained by um, um, something to do with the body clock, the circadian rhythm. Um, um, but our, our kind of subjective sense of time, um, how, how fast time seems to flow, can be affected by a number of things, some of which include um, whether we're panicking or not, and so there's, there's some attempts to explain that in terms of, if you like, the, um, the variety of thought that occurs over a shorter interval of time can have an effect on your sense of the passage of time. So there, there are kind of crisis situations where the flow of time seems to um, be very different. But I think in, in terms of um, very young children versus more senior adults, I suspect it, it also has to do with the breadth of your temporal perspective. So, so when I was saying earlier, you kind of occupy a temporal point of, of view on the world. So you're oriented to your past as well as your, your future. How you're oriented to the past and future is kind of recessively there in the background, um, even when you're not thinking about the past and the future. It's because we, we can't help but be psychologically oriented to, to what falls beyond the, the fleeting momentary present. And, and with, with, I think with, with greater breadth to that temporal perspective, and, and that greater breadth isn't just simply a matter of how long you've, you've been alive, but, but how, how much you've accumulated in terms of memory, I think can, can have an effect on your experience of the present. So I would speculate, guess that that, that has something to do with it. That's great. And while we're on the topic, actually, um, Matt, we've got another question which I want to put to you from Heather Dyke, which is that a lot of the features of our temporal experience that you mentioned at the beginning 
seem to be in tension with what we've learned from science. So this again, very timely comment given the Nobel Prize today. Um, so science seems to tell us a different story about what, what time is actually like. What do you think is the best explanation for that difference between how we perceive um, and how we experience time and what science tells us about what time is really like? Um, thanks to Heather for the question. So Heather's written some fantastic papers on, on just this topic, actually. So the, the, the way I think of it is, um, so I, I mentioned earlier that we, we occupy this temporal point of view that's determined in part by how we're psychologically oriented to past and future. Um, I think that affects how we experience the present. So I think of the present as something like the origin of a perspective. So, so just as, um, so take our visual perspective. Um, our visual perspective is from a certain place. There's a roughly a cone shaped region of, of space that I'm visually awake, aware of that I have the impression of being aware of it from somewhere. And um, that origin isn't a point. It has some spatial extension, the origin of my, my visual um, perspective. Um, but but the, the, the geom geometry of lines of sight and, and light doesn't determine everything about my visual perspective. I mean, I have a sense that I'm looking up at the stars rather than, than down at them. And that, that's determined by other things. So my, my sense of, um, of gravity and how that, that's uh, affected. Um, how I experience how that affects my experience of, of of space looking up rather than down and and similar I think with our temporal perspective we have a kind of origin for our temporal perspective which which isn't a point but is a region and that that region is is the present so that, that the present has some breadth for us um, and and just as our sense of gravity affects whether we feel like we're oriented by looking up rather than down at the stars how we're oriented to our past and future affects how we occupy that, that the origin of that, that perspective, so how we experience the present. So to tell a story about how you experience time would, would require going into all of those things and what it would be a story of would be a story of our perspective. Um, that of course then raises a question about what, well, what is it a perspective of? And, and is what it's a perspective of, on something that's there independently of that perspective. And that's where scientists may tell you something very different about the nature of time independently of that perspective. And then one question will be, well, is, is that really time? That, but I, I better stop there because that, that, I, I need to keep my answer short, sorry. <laughs> that was great, thank you, Matt. Um, Elizabeth and Ahmad, do either of you want to come in on the question about aging and about how we experience time differently depending on our age and how busy we are for instance. Um, I, I'll just make one comment. Um, so as you mentioned earlier the work that I'll take up now this year I'm um, starting is on on waiting and in particularly on waiting in, in queues and lines um, but I've been now reading lots of things on waiting and um, <clears throat> there's different types of waiting. And I think that um, what we are waiting for at different stages of our life um, changes, right? So like when you're a small child um, and your basic needs are met, you're often like waiting for your birthday um, or a holiday when you might be getting a present or for school to start or end, things like that. Um, and um, in midlife, you know, the types of things you're waiting for um, may be coming at you actually more quickly or more frequently um, and, and are of different stakes. And you have a sense, you have much more of a sense, um, again, under ordinary circumstances of how long you'll have to wait. Um, indefinite waiting is, is like when you actually can't get a fix on something is really, really hard. And I think that um, you experience that more when you're very young, This like you actually can't sense how time passes, all of your waiting feels indefinite. Um, and, and and so that may, I think, affect, because that's so difficult, affect one's experience of, of time passing at, at a young age. Um, but that's, you know, that is just speculation on my part. 
that's really that's really interesting um i was recently doing some work on victor frankl's book on man's search for meaning and he talks about lot there about his experience in um, Nazi concentration camps of what it was like to be waiting with no end in sight that there's that, that when you're a prisoner of, of indefinite time yeah. then you can't orient yourself to the future but unless you have a sense of the future then you lose all sense of purpose so there's something really really interesting there about he you know he says it's it, people often commented that a day in a concentration camp felt like a week or felt like a year because there was just no, first of all, no difference between the days, but also just no end in sight. So waiting just dragged out indefinitely. Yeah. yeah Emma. Sorry, go ahead. Oh, sorry, Elizabeth. No, do you carry on? I was just gonna say, you see that in literature um, and when talking to um, people who've gone through refugee experiences and through incarceration, particularly, um, so solitary confinement with sensory deprivation. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Sorry, Amar, go ahead. Yeah. No, thank you. That's great. Um, um, by no means I have answers to that important question, but just a reflection on my personal experience. I feel we live in a time where there's a lot of notifications. We're just waiting for uh, more notifications from all the emails and applications we have. And I just feel so happy and lucky that I lived in a time in the 90s where I didn't have any of that. I hardly used internet and just spent my summers reading some literature and uh, time felt so slow. But I think even now, if we just like put things on the side, um, time would definitely feel slower. And I think we really, need to appreciate and reappreciate the time and leave everything and just go for a walk uh, in the woods um, and connect a little bit more um, with time and with ourselves. I think just the rhythm of life now is just very, very fast and there's a lot of voices and a lot of opinions and information and just you feel like it's never enough. I need to do more, I need to read more, but maybe it's enough just to do less. So I think just the appreciation of time could be adjusted. Thank you. That's that's really interesting, actually, and it feeds in beautifully to a question that we have from Hans Christian Oettinger. And I'm going to put it to everybody. So he says, we might feel like we need to be available 24 hours a day, seven days a week, but computers and phones have an off button. I feel that during lockdown, we're much more flexible in choosing how to spend time. It's not about having time, but about choosing how we want to spend our time. Isn't it our task to make the choices as long as we're not in prison, he says. Can't we shape our future in that way? I'll start with Matt, if I may. Um, so I can have it. If you want my answer to be really short, this one, yes. Um, I, I agree. <laughs> <laughs> and I, but I just think it's really important that, that we realise that's the case. Um, what, that we can switch off and make a decision to do something different? Yeah, that, that, look, that... that that's right, that, that um, um, so the demands on our time and the, the kind of 24-7 um, culture that, that we seem to be part of now is, is, is not necessary. <laughs> These are results of choices that, that, that are made. Um, and the different choices can be made. How you affect those choices is, is obviously really difficult. Um, and, and this is where we need the um, political scientists to help us out because um, it, it, there's lots of cash to be made at the moment by, by having that kind of culture to commodify time in this way. Um, I mean, we, we always had um, deadlines of sorts, you might have thought. I mean, through, through the kind of natural changes around us, whether they're day and night seasons, um, the, these were cycles and rhythms that created deadlines for us that we have to adapt to. But now we've got a way of categorizing, labeling, dividing up time, which can, can obliterate all of that um, and, and just commodify units of time. Um, and that, that's part of the 24-7 way of living, I suppose. But that's, a, that's all a result of choices that are made and we, we can in principle make different choices. That's really interesting. Elizabeth, it reminds me of the bit in your book where you discuss the political economy of time. I wonder if you want to say a little more about that. Yeah, um, 
I think actually I might like to push back against the narrative of um, t like how time has changed in this uh, during this pandemic and like in the in in a um, um, quick transformation of of the demands on us because I have the very strong sense of mostly being among academics right now who's who uh, um, experienced the disruption of demands very differently than I think a lot of people did. So um, first of all, for ag academics, one thing we know is that <clears throat> there's such a thing as having um, too much unstructured time. And, and not only, you know, um, is that often not particularly useful, we don't necessarily gain a strong, a big sense of satisfaction from totally unstructured time, but it, it, it um, brings in uh, a, a, what's called the paradox of choice, I think, where you, know, you can have so much choice or so many different things that you could do, including nothing at all, um, that, that uh, we become paralyzed. Um, so for those of us who have the luxury of having slowed down, um, that is not just a blessing. There's also um, another side to it. But, but then I think for most people, um, although their lives have been reshuffled, they haven't, um, a lot of the kind of um, temporal structure hasn't been removed. So um, many, many, many people um, are finding more demands on their time. I, I, you know, they have no childcare. They are um, parenting, teaching, and also working. Um, and that's, you know, making their li lives intensely uh, demanding. Um, and then also for people who, who don't have um, economic privilege, there, there are deadlines in the form of bills that they can't pay and evictions they're going to experience. And um, so although there's, there's been a radical restructuring of, of time, like I, I, I just don't think that what's happening for most people is, um, is an opening up of, of opportunities to kind of have a more pleasurable experience of time or more relaxed, yeah, so. Well, that's really, you know, that's really important and actually brings us nicely to a question from Bindu Venkatesh. And Bindu asks about the concept of time for those in minimum wage work. How does their time get accounted for, especially when they have to do two or three jobs to make ends meet? So um, I I looked at the chat and saw the questions and mm -hmm. hoped that we'd get to talk about that because it's mm -hmm. really um, important. Uh, and I'm going to speak as a, a political scientist, a political theorist now, and say, um, you know, you don't get democracy in circumstances in which there's no leisure, right? There's no you don't you you you, you develop we develop the idea of democracy absolutely contingent on a class of people who have the leisure uh, to engage in philosophy and in thought and in all the types of deliberation that go into self-government. And that intentionally um, excludes people who have to support themselves. I mean, that's, that was, that's the purpose and that's the outcome, um, the expansion of the franchise to include, let's say, like all citizens or all adult citizens, you know, however you want to describe the boundaries around the franchise, um, kind of hopscotches right over the question of what it means for people to be expected to self-govern responsibly when they um, aren't um, independent of the kinds of constraints that work imposes. So then take that one step further and look at people who literally like have to work almost all the time that their body can permit them to work. Um, and you have people who are being structurally excluded by the, the de demands on their time um, from the opportunity to self-govern. And, and it is um, profoundly undemocratic, I think. Thank you. At this point, can I raise a question from uh, Robert Main, and I'm going to put it to Amar. So the question is about how the introduction of instant messaging and immediate contact with people all over the world 
has impacted your own feelings um, on the passage of time. And I, I know, Emma, for you, you know, this is obviously in some ways a mixed blessing because you've said that these kind of communicative technologies enable you to, you know, keep in touch with family and friends from afar and have enabled people tonight to tune in with us. But is it a kind of is it a kind of mixed blessing for you? What would you like to say to that? I think it is a mixed blessing. I do have like one or two months old messages that I should reply to and I haven't done yet. Um, and I think it's just really <laughs> embarrassing sometimes. You just add them to the guilt uh, list that you feel like I should reply, but you wouldn't reply. But I think like for me, I personally have deleted multiple uh, social media platforms and tried to concentrate only on one of them. So I can connect uh, with colleagues and um, scholars and journalists and people who are interested in, in their work, but I deleted like many others, like uh, without saying any of the names of these platforms. And I think like many of us are now stuck in, like you have messages here, you have emails here, messages on the other one, like, and you feel like there's a roller coaster, you have to go to each of them and reply instant, instantly because people see that you saw them, but you haven't replied. So that's true, that I should reply. Um, I think it's really challenging and we really have, like personally, I feel like we should slow down. And what I like about um, one artist from Serbia, maybe many of you know her, um, um, uh, she's a performance art artist, Marina Abramovic, um, who was designing with architect Rem Kolaus um, a place where people would go and leave their mobile phones and just like go to concentrate on time. And one of the missions is to count thrice so they have rice and they have to count the rice, just like slowing down and concentrate on that. And I think like one also, like another example, one of my friends, um, her daughter keeps like using social media and on her mobile phone. And then the mother wants to take all this from her and she told her, but I would be bored uh, without it. She said, okay, I want you to be bored. And I think we tend to forget to be bored, like just go back to the basics, connect with ourselves, um, concentrate on the things that matter to us. Um, and maybe reduce some of the, the the noise around us. Yeah, really interesting. It's really interesting, isn't it? I, one of um, one of my colleagues at King's, Kalina Gottman, said to me that somebody described emails to her as uh, somebody else um, pushing themselves to the top of your to do list which I thought was really fascinating, that sort of experience that now you have to do that thing that somebody else wants you to do. Really interesting. Some people are very disciplined, aren't they, at leaving all their emailing until the evenings or, you know, only turning their phone on at a certain time of day. Yeah. Great. If I may come back to a more political question now uh, for Elizabeth from uh, Maurizio at KCL. He wants to know if there's such a thing as a just distribution of time outside of the penal context. Uh, so he'd like to know your insights into the relationship between justice and time. So that's a great question that I've spent a good deal of energy trying in some ways to avoid <laughs> because it's so difficult. Thanks for, um, thanks for bringing it up. Uh, and I think that um, there's, there's um, too much that's kind of uncertain or unspecified and and uh, distinct to any individual about time to say like, oh yes, there is a, a just way for the state to deal with time. What I, the way in which I approach this in the work that I've done so far is to talk about um, the claims that we make when we use time in politics to do things like confer rights on people, um, and the claims that we make are that that time is kind of more neutral, more impar a more impartial way to transact um, over rights and power than some of the other options. Um, and, and in particular, that we can be fair using time in a way that we can't be fair if we like give our give rights to people based on their blood, um, you know, their heritage, or give rights to people based on, like, you know, how much money they have, aristocratic birth, um, those sorts of things. And um, that may be true, right? So those may be bad ways to <laughs> confer rights, and it may be actually that we have more opportunity to be just um, and egalitarian when we use time. And, and, and waiting periods and things like that. 
uh, but um, we will have to make very careful calculations if we want to approach the kind of, of fairness that we're claiming um, we're achieving and, and to come back um, to a couple points that we've kind of like just brushed up against. First of all, uh, Sarah mentioned like in the book, I talk about temporal formula, right? Because we're rarely just using time. We're usually trying to accommodate other factors, um, things, things that people experience, um, uh, qualities they have, special circumstances. Um, you know, we take time off of of probationary periods for citizenship when somebody does um, military service, for example, because that's so citizenly that surely you don't have to wait as long as somebody who hasn't done military service. But the most important thing that I, I think we have to um, focus on is whether <clears throat> when we do create those formula, um, whether we're actually treating like people in like ways and and if nothing else, like, you know, what constitutes being just is, is, is to some extent um, somewhat subjective. <clears throat> but if nothing else, um, if we're not treating truly like categories of people in like ways, then we know we haven't been fair um, because, uh, because that's like a baseline expectation of any type of just state to treat similarly situated people true when they actually are similarly situated in similar ways. That's that's great. And I mean, we've had some really interesting discussion from Amar about temporal injustice related to kind of physical displacement and destruction of place. And you've now discussed this other element of a kind of in, uh, injustice with respect to time. But one thing we haven't really discussed is about the intergenerational injustice um, with respect to time. And here I'm thinking in particular about the climate crisis. Mm -hmm. So I wonder if I could just come to Matt briefly and then back to Elizabeth and Amar as we round up, just to say a little something about time and the climate crisis. Um, so I, I suppose look, one way of thinking of this is it's a, um, an instance of the, the bias to the near in time, um, a bias to the near future. Um, so um, pr prioritizing um, rewards nearer in time than, than later. Um, I, I suppose there's all kinds of things psychologically that are playing a role here. In, in the failure in, in, in taking care of the planet. Um, so, so one is that, um, as I was mentioning, the way we represent and think about time and our action, you can think of as a kind of coordination problem. Um, but now for this crisis, it's, it's not just coordinating with people who are going to be around while we're alive, but, but people who are, <laughs> who are going to be around when we're not. Um, and so that, that makes the whole idea of coordination look very different. Um, so you might think it, it's, it's more about taking care of the planet rather than coordinating with future generations. Um, and then you wanna think about well, what, what, the, what the aim is in doing that. And it, I suppose the, the primary aim will be to prevent suffering. Um, the other thing to say is that our, our, our perspective is very partial, right? So we have, we're very finite, limited beings. Um, so we have a very limited perspective on things. One way of thinking about that is, well, even caring about the climate crisis with respect to humanity is a kind of partiality because, you know, what's humanity in the grand temporal scheme of things? Um, so it's, it can be good to be partial <laughs> in, in certain respects. But um, it, it has its negative effects as well, obviously, as we're seeing. Thank you. So we only have a couple of minutes left. I, I want to go to Elizabeth and Amar and just ask if you either want to say a, some, a little something about this or wrap up with some thoughts about the discussion of time more generally. Elizabeth. Sure. Well, I'll just make a comment on that um, question because it is like the question. Um, mm. Intergenerational justice is in some ways the question, but um, in particular, interge intergenerational justice as it pertains to the climate crisis. And I'm so kind of puzzled by this. Um, I've been thinking a lot about, you know, 
why we think that people who get to something first are entitled to it. Um, and like, I don't think the justifications are very good. And in particular, when it comes to natural resources that are um, finite or that are becoming finite because of choices we've made, like there's not a really good case to be made for, well, we got here first and we're gonna use them up. But one of the things that really astonishes me is like when we had open, very explicit commitments to, to kind of blood-based aristocracy, um, there was at least a sense that like, well, it might not be very good for other people um, who can never break into the aristocracy. Future generations um, are going to, are, are never going to have the opportunities, but we're at least preserving something for our own. Like there's some sense that you have some commitment to somebody besides yourself, if you are participating in a system that will privilege your own children. But when it comes to the choices that we make with respect to the climate, like we, as a, you know, the human race has decided that it doesn't even care about its own, like we don't care about our own children enough to take action. And, and that's a, to me, marks a, a really profound departure from how we've thought about, gener you know, future generations um, in preceding eras. So I, you know, I, I, it's a little mind boggling to me, but it does seem to be the case that that's the direction we've gone. Thank you. Emma, the last word goes to you. Thank you. I think just to comment on a question here on the relationship between hope and time. And I think a lot of times in times of chaos and revolutions, there's a lot of hope that change is possible, that the future and the alternative possibilities are possible. But a lot of times these hopes are crushed. So I think it's really a difficult to question the relationship between time and hope. It's really critical and the most tragic thing, as I think one of the authors said, is to lose the opportunity to imagine alternative future um, in any time. Uh, so that's maybe a statement, but also um, I think we're missing a slow rhythm of life, as Svetlana Boim says. So I hope that uh, we slow down and uh, have a slow evening. Thank you. Thank you so much. Well, of course, time flies and uh, the virtual bell is ringing. So all that remains is for me to thank our wonderful panelists, to thank all of you uh, for your fantastic questions. Please join us at the forum online next week on Monday, the 12th of October for our Philosophers Book Club event. The book is Iris Murdoch's Under the Net and everyone is welcome. Until then, goodbye.